All right, now that everybody's awake, what I, I want to int introduce to you Andre Bailey. He is today's speaker, and he's going to be talking about the relational leadership model. And he is an ELP advisor here. He's been here for 21 years, and he's also one of the University 102 instructors. And please give a warm welcome to Andre Bailey. Thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And first and foremost, I'd like to start off by saying uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, as was previously indicated, I want to say uh, how honored I am to be here this afternoon. Uh, having another, this is my second year, uh, to have had, received an invitation to return. Um, I am deeply humbled by the fact of being able to present to you with regards to the idea of the relational leadership model. The one thing I'll start off first and foremost by saying is that today, today is a, it's a great day today. Bless you. You allow me to say that. When I say today is a great day, it's a day that we've never seen before. And again, if anybody, if anybody in the audience has seen today before, please let me know. Okay, as, as I figured. Uh, with that being said, it's a new day, a new beginning, and a fresh start. And with that being said, you always want to think about what is it that you bring into today. The relational leadership model, again, as I would call your attention to chapter three of exploring leadership, the one thing that you want to know about the relational leadership model is the relational leadership model is not a theory. It's based in practice. So when you think in terms of the practice of the relational leadership model and it comes full circle, I think first and foremost it's critically important that I give you a brief background on myself. I'm originally from East Oakland, California, born and raised. Yeah, big ups, appreciate that. Again, when I say that, there is some significance to one's experience in having grown up in particular places. Even with that being said, all of you, all of us have our unique experiences. When I talk about East Oakland, California, I took a roundabout process to continue my education. University of California at Berkeley, Sacramento State University, and Sonoma State University. Now, as I talk about these institutions of higher education, or even mention them, you have to think in terms of prior to reaching these academic institutions, there was rearing and education that was taking place prior to getting to these institutions. And I'm talking about the people not only that love me unconditionally, but I want to make sure, because I want to paint a very vivid picture for you today with regards to your understanding of the relational leadership model. So when I think in terms of those that love me unconditionally, those that have poured into me, I'm talking about mother, father, grandparents, coaches, uncles, cousins, whomever you might deem family. And again, families are not just biological as we know. So again, it's on the basis of those that supported you unconditionally to get to where you are today. But I also want to make sure that you do not forget to acknowledge yourself, to think about what it took for you to get here. But most importantly, it's a reason why you are here today. You know, to be able to address the leadership program, when I say that it is an honor to do so, pretty soon many of you are going to be charged with the responsibility of supporting students transitioning to the university. And we want to make sure that you begin thinking or internalizing how you see your role in supporting other students in accomplishing the goal of achieving an undergraduate degree. Now with that comes a lot of experience. It comes a lot of, um, I'll say, uh, different perspectives, you have different insights, but often you're going to recall what has gotten you here, the morals, the values, the belief system. You know, again, it's, it's, real, uh, it's good for me to see a number of my students here. Uh, you know, in the fall I teach freshman seminars, mentioned. But the theme of my class, if anyone remembers, and I know you do, the theme of the class is who are we anyway? That's the theme of my class. You want to say why is that the theme of the class, but when you think of the question, of what makes you who you are today, when you think of that question, there are certain belief systems and value systems that you have acquired based on those that you've been reared by. If you think about why you believe what you believe, there's a particular reason why you do that. Again, one thing with the relational leadership model, the relational leadership model involves five primary components. Five primary components. As I provide you the model, or should I say the components and the elements of this particular model, 
inclusivity of people, diverse of points of view, diverse points of view empowers those that are involved, the ethical aspect, and I have to say it because those of us that stand back and observe, process oriented. You know, my daughter's last night, or should I say my youngest daughter, she told me, uh, I guess this year's uh, new artists uh, are all about the bass, about the maple training. I don't know, I know the song, all about the bass. Today it's going to be all about the process. And one thing that I would tell you is that with the relational leadership model, it is in fact all about the process. See, with the relational leadership model, there's not an anticipated or expected outcome. There's not a definitive outcome. The outcome is going to be what it is. But the fact of the matter is that when you think in terms of all of the components or the things that go within this particular model, it has to be practiced. When we talk about inclusivity of people, inclusivity of people requires that you're going to have a variation of perspective, a variation of beliefs. See, again, when we're looking, no matter what organization, community, uh, corporation, club that you're a part of, the fact of the matter is there's a diverse, diversity of ideas and attitudes even within those particular organizations. As I share with you the visual images of the elements, as you can see, process is the biggest thing up there. Process. But if you notice, purpose, the element of purpose overlaps all the other elements. Again, purpose overlaps the empowerment, inclusive, and the ethical aspect of this particular practice or this model of relational leadership. And again, notice that purpose, where purpose stands. One of the big things about today is that there's a particular purpose not only why you are here today, there's a purpose in why you were born, you know. I am, I'm going to help you create a personal shield today as well, but I want you to really think about not just why you're here, but why did you work so hard to get here? See, having my background, I recognize that you were accepted to a number of colleges and universities and you actually chose to come to Sonoma State. And in your choosing to come to Sonoma State, I know that you had worked really hard to prepare yourself to be positioned as a viable candidate to be accepted to anywhere you were going to be accepted to. But what was the purpose? Why, why did you come here? Why do you really want to continue your education? When I say purpose, there's a purpose in everything that you do. Your relationship with your siblings, your relationship with, with friends and family. What's your purpose? You always want to think in terms of, of your purpose. When I think in terms of purpose, I, I, I would be remiss not to think of the teachers of the leaders. This is a leadership class. So I always think in terms of the teachers of the leaders. So when I think in terms of even how I'm conceived as being a, uh, a leader, I can't help but to think of everything that is important to me. I think in terms of most important, I think about my grandfather right away. You know, my grandfather was my roommate in college for a year. I share this with my class. I generally don't share this with people. But if you can imagine, and let me say this real quickly. When knowledge speaks, wisdom listens. And I'll say it again for those of you who didn't hear that. When knowledge speaks, wisdom listens. See, for the most part, you have to be around to get wisdom. That's a class that they don't teach here at the university. There's no class called wisdom here at the university. And some of you, you're aware, some of you may have been told wisdom comes with age. Now what I would say to you is that I feel that each and every one of you have the ability, at some point in time in your life, you'll have the ability to, to do all the things that your instructors or people that have gone on and had a lot of education, uh, you have that same skill set and ability. Do I think that you have it now? Absolutely not. Again, you can't be more than one or two years in your undergraduate studies. But the thing with the relational leadership model is that we look to put everything in, in, into you. Resources, beliefs, value system, everything in you in the hope that you'll pay it forward. Now, in paying it forward, the hope is that it will come back to either your children, your community, organizations that you will become a part of. But the fact of the matter is you have to prepare yourself. And in preparing yourself, I want you all, as you have a, 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 take out a piece of paper, I want to help you develop a personal shield. And I'm going to give you some questions. And again, it's not that you have to answer these questions right now, but I want to make sure 
that you put these questions into the personal shield. Now, as you just simply, you don't have to be a particular artist in drawing this particular uh, this format, but make sure you have all five quadrants. And notice that the fifth quadrant is the one overlapping. In that first box, I'd like you to write, or at least put the question in there, three important values in your life. If you think of your value system and your belief system, in quadrant number one, you're going to ask, answer the question at your own leisure, three important values in your life. In quadrant number two, you're going to identify three to five people that you admire. If you think of three to five people that you admire, and take your time with it, again, this is yours. Three to five people that you admire. Quadrant number three. I want you to list three things that you're good at. Three things that you feel or believe that you're good at. In quadrant number four, you're going to list three turning points in your life. When I think of turning points in my life, I think in terms of going to college. I'm a first generation college student, being the first in my family. Not my mom, not my dad, not my sister, being the oldest of two, two children. Alpha and Omega, Andre and Z, and my mom, she didn't play, she said A and Z, and that's it. Um, another turning point in my life was becoming a father, becoming a dad. Uh, I'm a very proud father of three children, three daughters, my wife and I. Three daughters, Zaire, Amir, and Essence. Definitely a turning point in my life. And the third one was the loss of my very best friend. As I looked to go to undergraduate, uh, as I headed off to college, my very best friend that I went to elementary, junior high, high school, he was murdered. And that was a true turning point in my life. Uh, actually, he had named his, his child. Uh, he just had had a child. He graduated with honors, by the way. He had those gold sashes. And, <laughs> he had those. and uh, he was actually he was murdered. But he, in fact, uh, put our names together and he named his child a combination of both our names. I mean, man, that, that, that meant a lot to me. And last but not least, in that fifth box, if you state it this way, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Now, understand that that fifth box is overlapping all those other things. Now, what I've said to you, that's going to be your personal shield. And the one thing when I talk about the personal shield, remember I talked about purpose? You know, in honor of Black History Month, I will say this is, it is Black History Month. I mean, you, you may not know that walking across campus, if you see some of the, uh, the banners that are hanging along, you might know. But again, in other parts of the country, in other parts of the state, there is the honoring, the acknowledgement, and achievements of those of African descent born in America. And again, I happen to say that because as I think of those three people that I've asked you to think about, I've thought about some of mine as well. And I'm going to share some with you. Those conversations that I've had with my grandfather, you know, my grandfather was a huge boxing fan, and he would always talk about the champ. And again, if anybody knows the champ, there's only one person that you can refer to as the champ. And we're not talking about Mike Tyson or none of that. I, Muhammad Ali, you right, I, heard, I saw your lips with Muhammad Ali. So again, as I was watching some clips with Muhammad Ali and I was thinking with regards to relational leadership, there was a question posed to Muhammad Ali with regards to what he might tell his son. And so again, I want to make sure that in conveying what purpose is, because purpose is one of the most important aspects of this relational leadership model, I just want to share with you a, a clip here shortly. So I want to go to this clip. And please pay very close attention. Listen up close. And again, I always anticipate technical difficulty. With that being said, when Muhammad Ali was said to his son, he was asked a question. He said, you've been a boxer all your life. And he said, when it comes to your son, he said, what would you tell your son? And Muhammad Ali said, when something like this, he said, well, you know, first and foremost, I would try to control, he said, I would control him or help his mom control him in, such, in supporting him to go on and get a good education. He said, not only a good education, he said, well, Muhammad Ali, would you, uh, would you support your son in boxing? And he said, no, absolutely not. If you wanted to do it for the health aspect of it, but not as a living. He said, it's pretty, uh, 
that's a brutal way of, should I say, that's a dangerous way to live. And actually, you can lose your life boxing. But what he said was, he said, every man, every woman has a purpose in life. And one of the challenges is helping a person find their purpose in life. So again, he said he would possibly teach them foreign languages. He would probably teach them about the arts and sciences. So that as one becomes of age, that they'll be able to make informed decisions about what they want to do in life. But when we talk about purpose, purpose should have a meaning. It should be some meaning within the purpose that you're living your life. So again, when I saw that clip with Muhammad Ali, I was like, that far back in the late 60s or early 60s, that he was talking about purpose. He also said that he'd like to be known as a black Henry Kissinger. Now, Henry Kissinger is clearly above our age. I'm sure Mr. Peterson uh, clearly, I mean, I'm saying on the basis of, you know. Henry Kissinger was the Secretary of State, a phenomenal Secretary of State, and he was a, a, was a great diplomat. And so when Muhammad Ali was talking about going over to other parts of the world to help those that are in need, those less vulnerable, and, and those are just wherever he can help, because he, he became very famous. He was a well-known face. And so even with that being said, it was just it's so interesting to recognize purpose. And then to go over and understand there has to be a balance. You know, the other aspect of, I wanted to bring an animated clip with regards to the Lion King, and actually, I, you know, I don't know if that, that one clip. Okay. Yeah, it is in there. With the Lion King, everybody's seen the Lion King, right? You know, it's that when uh, Simba, I mean, uh, Mufasa was talking to Simba and they was on this mountain and they were walking up the mountain and Simba was asking all these questions about not just the, the uh, circle of life, but the, the reason that we all exist. And Mufasa had to tell Simba that, you know, one day we will no longer exist and we won't be here. Again, he was saying that we will pass on. But when one passes on, the body turns into grass. But everything has to, everything has a place. And as, a, as not just an overseer, but someone that looks to provide purpose and meaning to life and to the world, everything has to be appreciated from the crawling ants to the antelopes to, to the birds to the flock to everything. See, the thing is, and I want you guys to know, we're all, we're all in this together, not just today, but we're all interconnected. And what I, what, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, I've said this in class before, that we can come to the university and split atoms and send rockets to the moon, but what does that all mean if we don't recognize how we're all interconnected? You know, if there's someone that is, let's say, in need of medical attention, or I'll say a blood transfusion, that person is not taken to a veterinary hospital. And I, the reason that I said that is because, again, when I say that we're all in this together, we know that there are no more Jim Crow laws, but there are Jim Crow attitudes. And when I say that, I'm saying that we wouldn't want anything, I'm saying we as students, as, as you know, future citizens of this nation, we wouldn't want anything for our children that anyone else would want. So again, when we think in terms of preparing yourself for leadership, you also want to think in terms of supporting those that are going to come behind you and how are you preparing yourself to do so. With that being said, to understand that balance, I'll go back to the purpose. Because again, when we talk about purpose, you want to understand that it is absolutely necessary to have a shared vision and or common ground. So when we talk about the purpose, purpose is vision driven and not position driven. You know, also, I would say that the leaders and members promote the organization's purpose through a shared vision and not for self gain. That was critically important to put that up there because we all know someone that in a position of authority or a position of power, it could be an organization, a student, a club, a, a team, a, a, a university, and people really love power. I've told my school, the world is ran by money, power, and control. That's what the world is ran by, money, power, and control. But as undergraduate students, you want to think and tell you, what is your power right now? What is the power that you have as undergraduate students, as you are a student and preparing to be, what is the power that you have right now? The power that you have is the knowledge of self. The more that you can continue to find out about yourself, that is when you're able to express your ideas and have a sense of confidence because you have a sense of, uh, a strong sense of self. And that's absolutely necessary when we're talking about purpose. You have to understand that, again, the difference between 
a shared vision and common ground is something that leads us all to either a, a positive change, a positive or a common purpose. It's necessary when we're talking about organizations, okay? Also, when you get into the organization in and of itself, there's the aspect of knowing, being, and doing. This knowing thing is about knowledge. Particularly in the relational leadership model, if in fact there's the idea that someone's not just going to follow you, but they're going to listen to you, there has to be the conveying of knowledge or a sense of knowledge. Not necessarily having to be the expert, but you have to have some familiarity. If you're looking to support others or you're looking to have others uh, take heed in what you're saying, they want to know that you have some sense of credibility. If you don't have any sense of credibility, why should I why should I listen to you? What make, I mean, we had a, a young lady a couple of weeks ago, we were, we were asking her, you know, if you're in an organization, a student organization, why should, why should someone listen to you? And she said, because I have a high school diploma. And so we had to end the conversation for the simple fact that we want to know about your experiences. What experiences have shaped you to be the person that you are? Okay? The, the knowledgeable part, again, Knowing and knowledgeable, that is a critical component when we're talking about relational leadership. The, the being part, now this is, this is interesting with the being part, because it's interesting it says self and others. But before you can be aware of anyone else, before you can be aware of anyone else, you have to be aware of yourself. And what does it mean to be aware of yourself? Self-understanding, self-awareness, self-esteem. You have to be aware of self before you can even begin to become aware of others. You have to know what irritates you. What, what is your irritation? What things annoy you? What things you like, what things you don't like? So that way, you don't arbitrarily, or should I say, put, have yourself in a position where you're totally either frustrated or you can't work with a group or organization. You have to know yourself and know your limits. Um, the doing aspect, often I will say, uh, don't talk about it, be about it. You know, you may have heard that before. Because for the most part, this shared common vision, anyone can have a particular vision, but if it's not action-oriented, then it's just that, it's a vision, or it could actually be a dream. You know, if you're not putting any action with regard to your vision, then it's, it's just a dream, it's just a vision. So the doing part, or the action-oriented oriented part, the action-oriented part is very necessary to bring about full circle. And what I would tell you is that this particular format is actually circular in design. The pattern of influence is circular and it's not a straight path. So it actually it actually rotates. You got your, your knowing and your knowledge. You got your your action at the bottom, but again you got your knowing itself and wanting to know about others. What what happens when you know about others? When you actually put yourself in the position to embrace learning, to embrace learning. Now here at the university Particularly in the Western philosophy of thought, it's all about the grades. I want to make sure that I'm doing whatever I need to do to get the right grade. Some students actually find out what the professor likes, and they'll do just that because I got to get a B or an A out of the spot. But if you think just for a moment, a novel concept of just embracing learning, if you embrace learning and you want to maximize the potential in your learning, could you imagine how well you would do in a class just on the potential, just on the aspect of you embracing learning? That is the same premise that's applied to learning about other people. If I really want to know something about you, or if I really want to get to know you, then I'm going to have a vested interest in just wanting to, to sit down and talk with you. I want to know what your experiences were like. Because like I started off by saying, all of our experiences are uniquely different. But if I expect everyone to have the same experiences as, as I have, then what am I really, am I really, going outside of my box? Am I really learning all that there is to learn? With regards to knowing, being, doing, the inclusive part, the inclusive element of this relational leadership model, you have to understand exactly what inclusive means. The inclusive, being inclusive means understanding, valuing, and actively engaging diversity in views, approaches, styles, aspects of individuality, such as sex or gender, or even culture for that matter, that adds multiple perspectives to a group's activity. 
So again, from an example standpoint, and we're talking about inclusivity. When you embrace learning, you are allowing yourself to be inclusive of different perspectives, different ideas. It might even be a different way of doing things. Something that you may have never even thought about. The one thing that you want to think in terms of why it is so critically important from a relational leadership model to involve or incorporate external stakeholders and possibly shareholders. Who else, you always want to think, who's invested in this, 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 let's say, not the group or the organization, but who's invested in this goal? Who's in, invested in this objective? What are we trying to achieve here? Is there a common objective or is there a stated objective that your group, organization, community, your school, is there a stated objective that the leadership program is trying to achieve? So the thing with that common ground and that shared ground, it's so important to be able to identify all the stakeholders because the stakeholders and shareholders might have a different outcome. They, they might look for something different. But if in fact that we all have the same shared common goal, it's possible that we might just work that much harder to make sure that we achieve this goal. The one thing that I did say, I, I shared with you that I work for, for EOP. And I like to say that I work for a program that values human beings more than profit. Now it's not just a matter of saying that, but I work with a group of dedicated and committed individuals who recognize the value of our support for students that have overcome tremendous odds to give you. And when I say tremendous odds, obstacles, adversity, but again, as they overcome these things, we want to make sure that we're there to provide whatever type of assistance, support that we can, because the end goal is that a student completes their undergraduate degree. So when you look at all the stakeholders, you got stakeholders as in parents, you got stakeholders as in students, uh, advisors, particular companies and corporations. There's companies and corporations that they want to know well, how prepared are these students. So again, if we're all invested in this together, think about the effort and the energy that goes forward to making this goal happen. You know, I put in, like I said, with regards to things that I was thinking about, and again, I know that Jimi Hendrix was a, a great particular rock star, and, but again, there's a lot of artists that, even prior to being artists, were either activists, but they saw something in the world. And as you know, a lot of artists, when they create music, they create music from particular experiences. They create music to send messages to the world. And Jimi Hendrix says, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, that's when the world would know peace. The power of love overcoming the love of power. Now just for a moment, again, because there's one thing about when I talk about this shared goal, there's a particular energy that comes with that. When all, when everyone's together, with all the stakeholders and shareholders, uh, I'm trying to look all the way to the back, somebody's far in the back. Uh, you know, I need somebody in the back of right there. Minwa, please. Minwa, if you would, uh, if you wouldn't mind standing up and just saying yes as loud as you can. And again, do not be worried because the walls will not crumble. This is a $165 million facility. So I just want you to say, and I appreciate it, if you could just say yes as loud as you can. <laughs> OK? Not really the word is why you want just yes as loud as you can. Yes. OK, that wasn't very loud. Hi. Uh, no, thank you. Hi, I mean, wait, hi, please. Loud as you can. And again, Minwalk, keep standing, because we're all in this together. Hi. And again, I'm not putting you on the spot. Everybody in the wall, in the wall, everybody. This is Heidi, Heidi, everybody. Heidi, if you could just say yes loud as you can. Yes! Okay, now she, she yelled it out, yes. Now Heidi, keep standing, I want to be wall by itself. Now, with that being said, I, I know that for the most part, those of you that are in the very back row, you could, you could hear her, but probably not as loud. And this time, I want everybody to stand up. Yeah, you can suck your teeth, you can lift your arm, everybody can lift your arm, you know? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Tucker, I appreciate that. So take your time, now put your books to the side, you know? Now, the one thing that is always critically important, you
you always want to know where you are. And I'm talking about institutions, communities, and whatnot. And at this point, I think if everybody just take the time, and I'm just, I'm just interested in seeing how it sounds like. If everybody just said yes, on the count of three, as loud as you can, what that might sound like. Now, on the count of three, we're just going to say yes, as loud as you can. One, two, three. Yes! I mean, I, I know I did say that, but did you guys feel that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Last time, thank you. This time, I want you to just say yes, I matter. Yes, I matter. So on three. One, two, three. Yes, I matter. Man, we don't even have a football program here. That's well. Thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time. What I want to do is make a point in demonstrating that type of energy, okay? And again, it's just a real simple exercise. I mean, very, very simple, you know? But again, that might have been a simple exercise, but on the basis of the energy that you just felt in saying that, can you imagine again if we're all invested in the same, in the same common purpose, in the same shared, shared cause? So what I'm saying is, when you recognize that you're not alone in this, you, and you understand the energy, that particular momentum and that energy, when everybody's on board, it has a tendency to take a life of its own, okay? So again, when you think you come pragmatically or organizationally, when everybody a part of your organization, where, whether it's all the student leaders, whether it's all, all let's say, a, a particular sports team, when everybody's focused on the same common goal, whether it's a family, a community, that's where power is. Again, as we continue to move forward, the empowerment division and empowerment is one of the key elements and components to the relational leadership. So when we talk about empowerment, there are two, two dimensions with regards to empowerment. First and foremost, you have the sense of self that claims ownership. I just talked about saying, yes, I matter, but there should be an expectation that you have of asserting and being able to not only ask the question, but it should be the expectation that you expect to be involved in a process, that your idea is to be heard. Your experience is very valuable. Your experience is very valuable. You know, some people give their power away, you know, because they, they don't believe that they can either ask a question or they feel that the person that's in the front is the expert, so it's like, I don't want to ask anything, and you just literally give your power away. But on the basis of understanding or having a sense of, of inclusivity and knowing the fact that you have an expectation to be involved, that gives you a sense of mattering. So again, when you're working with other students, whether you're working with, uh, let's say, students in the residence hall, where you're, it's important that everyone feels like they matter. See, I talked about process-oriented. Remember I said it's all about the process, and those of us that look at the process, when I take a step back, what I'm trying to look at and what I'm trying to assess is if I see somebody that's not engaged, I want to know why they're not engaged or do you have anything that you'd like to say? Because I want to make sure that I'm conveying a sense that not only everyone matters, but your experience, your thoughts, your values, your belief system. No, does everyone have the same belief system? Absolutely not. But that is not to discount or disregard someone's belief system. I just might learn something. So again, in that class, when we talk about who are you anyway, it is necessary to have that strong sense of self before moving to other classes as you look to acquire information. Remember that knowledge that we talked about? Knowledge is critical and key. So again, the second dimension is that environmental, the environmental conditions that promote full involvement of participants by reducing barriers that block development of individual talent and involvement. Are you guys following that? Are you catching that there? So as a particular leader, it doesn't make a difference where you've come from, okay? It's all about how one not only feels about themselves, how one sees themselves, but also what you're willing to learn. The ethical and moral aspect of leadership, it's important to understand where ethics and morality come from. It's actually comes, it's derived from a particular belief system. So when we talk about morality or uh, the ethic, I mean, it's the idea of the hope that the people that are in these positions of authority or in these positions of power, there's a kind of an idea or a hope that they will do the right thing. But there's no guarantee that they do the right thing because remember, ethics and morality is based on belief systems. So 
if you don't particularly uh, have a, a belief system that encompasses everybody, or let's say it's just a me, myself, and I theory, you know, I, 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 these fries are for me. Yeah. You know, can I get some fries? No, I'm hungry right now. You know, I'm not going to share you whatever the case may be. If that's your belief system, and it's not inclusive, and you're not looking to support maybe the person sitting next to you, how strong can you really be? How strong can a community be? How strong can an organization be? Again, so understand the, uh, the principles that conduct or, uh, yeah, again, the principles of conduct governing an individual or profession, the standards of behavior. As you know, every particular profession has ethics. You know, whether it's teachers, they have their code of ethics, legality, medical. Uh, again, everyone has their code of ethics. You know, again, staying with these leaders, everybody always thinks about the head, you know, that knowledge part that we've been talking about. And again, it's Dr. Martin Luther King. He says, never, never be afraid to do what is right, especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds that we inflict on the soul. So that's why I'm saying everybody always thinks about the knowledge aspect. And, and, and we, we got an amazing uh, recreational center. Everybody wants to work out. Everybody wants to, you know, everybody wants to get their workout on. But no, but we very often forget about that inside. You know, the human body, again, again, I'm not get questioning your belief, but mind, body, and soul, mind, body, and conscience, however you look at it. Now, one thing that I would ask you is when you think about those that have supported you unconditionally, think about the characteristics of these people. Think about the characteristics. Anything, and again, I do, uh, Alexis, when you think about those that supported you unconditionally, and you think about the character of these people, what are some of the characteristics of these people that, that you think about when you think about the people that supported you in getting here? What, what, what were they like? What, what, can you tell me anything or just one thing? And anybody else while Alexis is thinking, can you think about any of the characteristics of the people that supported you unconditionally? What, what are some of those characteristics, real quickly, please, anybody? Alexis, and definitely think about it. Anybody? Sincere. Okay, thank you. Sincere. You know, it's interesting that you say sincere because, again, and again, I want to get some of these characteristics, but Abraham Lincoln says this. When the conduct of men is designed to be influenced, persuasion, kind, unassuming persuasion should never be adopted. If you would win a man or a woman to your cause, first convince him that you are his sincere friend. And you said that. His sincere friend. Again, therein is a drop of honey that catches his, his heart or her heart, which say what he will. In the high road to his reason, and which once gained, you will find but little trouble in convincing his or her judgment of the justice of your cause. What are some of the other characteristics when you think about people that have supported you unconditionally? Any thoughts whatsoever? Please, Miguel. Persistent, okay? Persistent. Commitment and dedication. Again, when you think of these people, and again, I'm not trying to give you the answer to some of your, the people that you listed in your box, you're the one to come up with it. I don't know what characteristics the people that you've had supported you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Anything else? Actually, up at the top. Selfless. Selfless. Is that an instructor up there? I can, I can barely right? Selfless. And let me say this. True selflessness. I know in some of your leadership classes you are, uh, you have the Dao of leadership. I mean, Dao is spelled, it's spelled T-A-O, but it's pronounced Dao. True selflessness, in essence, is selfish. And, and, and again, to explain that, one of the characteristics, and again, self, self, uh, selflessness is definitely one of them, but there's another one about frugality. If you think about some of the people that have support, possibly very frugal, it's not because they couldn't have more, it's because they want more to give to you. So when you think about the resources, again, we're talking about the relational leadership model, the more, the more that I can give to you, whether it's financially, educationally, intellectually, the more that I give, the more that it's going to come back. Not necessarily to me, as I stated before, possibly siblings, family, community, schools, but absolutely right. So again, when you think of those characteristics, you want to think in terms of what this relational leadership model is all about. So when we take a step back, and then we, can see, we, we begin to see you actually exhibiting 
those particular characteristics and support of other people, it's all coming full circle. Didn't we start off by saying that this particular, this particular model is not based in theory? It's based in practice. And I'll tell you something else. It's not so much the more you practice, the better you get. You practice how you play, okay? You know, I know we're in a new generation and some people like, practice, practice? Yeah, practice. You practice how you play. So again, I wanted to make sure that you understood that. So again, keep in mind that as I came in today, there was also a message from the Hopi elders. The Hopi elders, again, as a Native American tribe. And please listen very closely. There's a river flowing very fast, and it is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They feel that they are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore and push out to the middle of the river. Now when I talk about these Hopi elders, we talk about Native American, we're talking about what Christopher Columbus thought he was, you know, when he thought he came into India, because again, I think he's an Indian. I mean, again, the residents of India would be Indian, but Native American, so we're talking about the Native American tribe. At this time in history, now we say at this time in history, remember we said that today is a new day, a new beginning, and a fresh start, and we say at this time in history. We're in the 21st century, in the year 2016. Today is 2016, February 16, 2016. And we still, in our lifetime, are having conversations that are, how should I say, things that perhaps our grandparents and our great parents would think that as a civilized society, a civilized nation, that we have gotten beyond that. And on the contrary, because we haven't been putting into practice that relational leadership model, we're still today having the same conversation. You go back to um, Jimi Hendrix, when the power of love overcomes or overrides the power, I mean, the love of power, that's when the world will have peace. I want you to know that the way of the lone wolf is over. And when I say I want you to know, believe none of what you hear and half of what you see. And I'll say that again, too. You believe none of what you hear and half of what you see. The most feared person is a researcher. That's why you're in school. You're in school to become more knowledgeable and to educate yourself to the reality of the world you live in. You know, again, those of you that are in the natural sciences, there is, in fact, a methodical way that you have to go about your chemistry, your biological sciences, and your math and whatnot. But again, on the basis of understanding that you've come to college to literally gain an education to the world that you live in, okay? The reality of the world you live in. So when you say the way of the lone wolf is over, Gather yourselves, the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in sacred manner and in celebration. The last thing I stated with the Hopi elders that said, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. When I say we are the ones that we've been waiting for, you are the ones. Now when I say you are the ones, whether you're going to be a CSA, an orientation leader, a peer mentor, we are the ones, you are the ones that we've been waiting for. How will you support the new students coming into this university? How do you envision your degree? What is the value of your degree? Is it up to the instructors or the professors to make that value? Or is it for the citizens of this campus community, the residents of the students of this campus community, to make sure that the other students that are going to be coming to your university, because one day the hope is that this will be your alma mater. You want to start thinking in terms of the legacy. Now you guys are first, second year students, first and second year students, but you want to start thinking about your legacy now, not after you get out. You want to start thinking about it now. <laughs> Going back to where I started, in Big Bowl, it's all about the process. The process creates energy, synergy, and momentum, just as that simple exercise. Yes. I matter. And that yes, I matter, when we have a collective group of I matters, it makes a difference in the work that you do. So again, when you understand that it's all about the process, the process component of the relational leadership model means that individuals interact with other leaders, other participants to work together to accomplish change. What type of change? It is our whole positive change. Again, we're looking to create positive change in particular communities, in particular groups, in particular organizations. Never, never let it say that your opinion or your experience doesn't matter. 
Um, with that being said, I just want to make sure that as you come to the university and you understand this meaning making, or I should say, wanting to make sense of all of this, I will tell you simply, in all of your getting, you know, as you're getting these classes, and you're going, in all of your getting, get an understanding. In all of your getting, get an understanding. You're taking in a lot of information, you're moving to the knowledge and understanding, but you see the progression. So in all of your getting, get an, get an understanding. Recognize and know that there are those of us to support you while you're here at the university, that this is a very, uh, it's not just a unique experience, it's our hope that this is one of the most memorable experiences in your undergraduate lifetime. And I say undergraduate lifetime because this should be something that's memorable for the rest of your life. It's not, you're not supposed to be walking around campus pulling your hair out. Again, it's not just uh, finals week or something like that. But what I'm saying is that this should be an enjoyable time. I want to thank you again for taking the time to listen. I hope that you were able to the very best in their leadership opportunities here, but make sure that you incorporate everything that you learn. All right, thank you.